In honor of Black History Month, Tacoma Historical Society is honored to share a few stories which we hope will inspire you to continue exploring the deep and rich history of Black lives in our community. The stories you will see and hear in this presentation are just a fraction of those we have gathered and shared over the past several years. In our mission to preserve, present, and promote Tacoma's history, we remain committed to the work of documenting, researching, and sharing the stories of the diverse range of people who have shaped our city. Exploring Black history in Tacoma brings a local lens to larger national themes of racial discrimination and the ongoing fight for social justice. It is also an opportunity to learn about people from all walks of life, educators, soldiers, musicians, leaders, doctors, athletes, entrepreneurs, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, who have left their mark on our community and the larger world. Thank you for watching. History is very important. We must be able to see where we come from in order to make progress as far as where we are going. It's a historical background. And that's very important for our youth to know about history, the history of Tacoma, for example, how we are where we are right now and how did we get there and who helped us get there and will there be a continuation? But history is a background to learn from. It's a start. It's not an end. It's a start. And so that is very important for us to know the historical part of Tacoma. Tacoma is my home. I love Tacoma. The, so the exhibit title is A Pioneering Spirit, A Fight for Liberty and Freedom. And so for me, so this was the first um, commission piece project that I did straight out of art school. And so I had, um, I was trying to figure out who I was as an individual, as an artist and um, discover, you know, my voice. And so I, I happened to be selected as an artist to work with the museum. It's no longer in Tacoma, um, but it was called the African-American Museum of Tacoma, Washington. Um, and, you know, learning this history opened up a world to me that I had not known about the contributions of my own people to the state that I lived in. I had been taught this, this um, history in, in Washington state history in school and I hadn't been introduced in any other way. Um, I wasn't really um, a person that knew a lot about, you know, museums or, or, or any of that. I wasn't introduced to that. And so it's, this exhibit's really special to me because it showed me the, the incredible contributions that African-Americans have made to this state in a time when they were not considered equal, um, when they couldn't do things, when they didn't have the freedoms um, that other people had to own land and to live where they wanted to live, but yet they still um, endured and uh, made these lasting contributions that people don't even still know about today. Um, so, that encouraged me as a young woman, um, finding my confidence within myself and within my skill set and being able to um, go for that. You know, a lot of the stories had to do with the, their pioneers from the Pacific Northwest, but they're pioneers that really affected really the, the exact location that my family actually ended up migrating from the South and living in, which was the Hilltop neighborhood. Um, I moved away when, when I was young, but I was very much connected to Hilltop through my family. We've got five generations of people that have lived there. So um, you have pioneers in this exhibit that actually were able to buy the land that we ended up residing on and that we ended up residing on through actually racist practices like redlining and you know a way of segregating people into 
um, certain places that they were only supposed to live. So there's so much history and there's so much revelation um, that came to me through this experience. So I would say one of the people that really stuck in my mind is George P. Riley. And he was um, a man that actually uh, created the Workingmen's Joint Stock Association. And that association later purchased some of the acreage that is right now Tacoma's present day hilltop. And so that pioneer definitely has connections to, um, to the local area. Also, you mentioned Nettie Asbury. She helped to establish the Tacoma chapter of the NAACP in 1913. And she also was instrumental in organizing demonstrations that led to the, the defeat of a racist um, uh, law, actually, a powerful rules committee measure against interracial uh, marriages in the state of Washington. She was also a teacher. She, um, oh, wow. I mean, as I said, I'm not a historian, but, you know, she was instrumental in the um, Colored Women's Club and uh, founding chapters and just, um, she's the only woman that was part of the selection. Doesn't mean that there weren't many other women in that era, in that age doing instrumental things, but for this particular series, that's, that's you know, how it came out. Um, but I was really influenced by her, especially because she's uh, the work that my, my grandmother actually did and the connections that she had um, working with organizations like the Colors Women's Club as well. So again, it's that personal connection. So those two pioneers, um, I think they have probably the most connection locally. Malteris Washington was born in 1919 on a farm in Columbia, Mississippi. One of 13 siblings who formed a family choir, Washington grew up singing and couldn't remember a time when he didn't enjoy music. That said, it wasn't until he enlisted in the military that he learned to play a musical instrument. Washington joined the Army in 1941 and began learning the clarinet at the U.S. Army School of Music. He shined shoes to earn enough money to buy a saxophone as well. The tenor saxophone would become his favorite instrument. By the time he was posted to Fort Lewis in 1944, as the drum major for the 21st Army Band, he was an accomplished musician. During this time, there was increasing pressure to ensure that amenities provided to African American soldiers on base were equivalent to those offered to white soldiers in the still segregated military. In Tacoma, Dr. Nettie Asbury was among those leading this push for equal treatment at Fort Lewis. Dwight Eisenhower visited Fort Lewis in 1947 and recommended the expansion of the Black Non-Commissioned Officers Club. Washington organized an all-black jazz band to play in the club's new ballroom. When President Truman signed Executive Order 9981, desegregating the armed forces, Washington seized the opportunity to lead by example, integrating his band with the inclusion of white trumpeter Neil Friel, who was born in 1930, and was a graduate of Tacoma's Bellarmine High School. Washington also joined the formerly all-white 2nd Infantry Division Jazz Band, further integrating musical activities at Fort Lewis. After retiring from the Army in 1962, Washington chose to stay in the area settling near Fort Lewis, he formed his own jazz group, the Mel Washington Trio, and during his career he shared the stage with jazz greats such as Count Basie, Quincy Jones, and Cannonball Adderley. Described as a friendly musician who liked to make people dance, Washington was known for his kindness and generosity, qualities that helped him break down barriers of prejudice. His trio was the first African-American group to perform regularly at venues such as Tacoma's Yacht Club and Elks Club. The audience that was most important to Washington, though, was the hundreds of children he taught to play music. 
He worked as an administrative assistant for the Tacoma Public Schools for three decades while volunteering his time to teach music. Quote, he'd steer kids in the right direction, his son Larry said about him after his death in 2007. Quote, he was a gentle giant. He used his horn to aid the troubled dudes. And I had a wife and two babies and trying to get a home built. Discrimination was a big, big thing and redlining districts and, and, and just getting a loan uh, or going, you know, going into the bank downtown like anybody else, you've saved your money. You've bought the property. You got a good contractor. You got a good bank. But you still can't get it through. And then you discover, here's some guy down there that doesn't know what it's like to be me. And he's coming from, well, you people don't pay your bills on time. Well, God damn it, I do. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not all of you people. I do. And if you don't believe it, look at my record. But don't lump me into what your belief system is when you don't know. You know, if you look at your your loan uh, uh, portfolio, you'd be amazed at how many of the people in your loan portfolio are black. And if not, you ought to ask yourself, why not? Tacoma Area 3, Security Grade, D. There are several Negro families, three known, who own property and live in this area. This constitutes a sufficient hazard to justify a fourth grade rating. This is from a 1937 research agent's report and map to classify all of Tacoma's districts. He gave any section with a population of non-white people a D, fourth grade, the lowest possible. On the map, these areas were colored red. Real estate agents and banks use this map to prevent black people from buying outside of the red areas in a practice known as redlining. The Supreme Court declared this practice illegal in 1948. But in reality, non-white people for many years after found it nearly impossible to have a free choice of where to live. So we wanted to buy a house. And of course, for me, that was one of the things also with us. And, and my family was always owning your own home mm -hmm. and, and being stable because it, for them it presented stability. And for us, I still see that you must have stability in your life, even though my husband was in the military. So when I looked in the, in the paper back in those days, you know, newspaper and whatever, and then I had called an agent that I wanted to go to look for a house because we were, we didn't have, we weren't making very much money in the first place, but I had seen places that I really wanted to live and wanted to, not for somebody else to tell me where to live. So after I made the appointment for the um, agent to come and he, uh, he drove up and of course, when I opened the door and he saw who I was, then he was sort of backing up and I just invited him in. And um, began to, because he saw that I was an African-American woman, and I think he didn't really want to deal with me, and he didn't want to really take me where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And then when I brought him in and I met to him, now, my husband is in the military. He is there defending all of the country. It didn't regard, regardless of color out there in the bad weather and the snow, and we are here, and I want to buy the house, and I want to go where I want to go. 
And he said, well, I will find your house if I have to sell you my house. Wow. And so then we went out and again we bought our sons, but we ended up with the house we can afford and believe it was on 1041 South Prospect. I didn't know anything about any red lining or anything like that. But having lived in New York, we know in this growing up in the South, there's overt discrimination. We would see over the doors, colored only. Or you'd go into the railroad and it's colored only. They were all visible segregation. But then when you come in with this covert cover-up segregation, and it was going on in Tacoma, and I found out later it was not just within housing. It was in schools. Mm-hmm. It was in employment. It was in other areas. So that, in turn, because coming from a background of social justice and seeing that that does not work for me. So that, in turn, was my first real confrontation in regards to discrimination in Tacoma. So, you, you know, just think, as I think about um, the, the whole era of uh, redlining, I, I, I think about that it wasn't just a momentary thing. It has had generational effects. Um, what we know about um, home ownership um, and building equity, that it has been the most um, reliable and most consistent way of building generational wealth. And so the inability to do that for decades has really resulted in lower, um, you know, personal wealth and generational wealth in black communities. Um, and, you know, we see all kinds of ex- expressions of that, um, the, the wealth jump differential, um, regardless of um, people's income level, that there's still that, that you know, stark difference in, in wealth accumulation for the white population and um, especially African-Americans, but also other people of, of color. And, um, y- you know, What's so detrimental about the the redlining? In part, there's the, the the access to building wealth through through equity, and so we you know so so it shows up in lots of ways today, even though it was a practice that we like to point to as a historical practice. But there's still vestiges of you know there's study after study currently um, that shows that African Americans don't have the same access to um, the real estate markets. So some of it <clears throat> is a result of some of the steering, uh, what's called steering practices of the, um, you know, we could say that, it, that it's individual um, realtors, um, but, but it's, it's institutional, right? I mean, it, it is a factor that is um, practiced by the industry. My name is Dolores Silas, born in Indiana, reared in Wisconsin, been in Tacoma at least since 54. This is home for me. I love Tacoma. I went to Tuskegee Institute, a university in Alabama, the George Washington, Washington, Booker T. Washington area. And there they taught differently, that you couldn't say no. They, They would not accept no that you had to come up to bar or beyond. And so that started me into education. And then when I left Tuskegee, I came to Tacoma, went to University of Arizona for my master's, went to San Diego, United States International University for my doctorate. And so I've been educated, minded all of my life and enjoy working with youth. Um, so I know you were the principal at DeLong, right? Yes. How was it being, and you can share as much or as little as you want about mm-hmm. this, how was it being a woman of color back in the day and being 
the first woman of color in that position and yes. just having the influence during that time? It, it was a challenge. In addition to students were fine, they, they love you regardless. There was an educational part for teachers who were new to the world of Af African Americans. Uh, parents were kind of can she or can't she? And so I'm standing there, I'm working with students trying to educate. I'm working with teachers trying to help them provide for students. I'm working with parents who don't really know what, what I am. And so it was difficult. It was, so it's threefold type of, it's a challenge. <laughs> it was really a challenge. And after a while, the majority of the students, well, in fact, all the students were fine. I still had to educate teachers. I had to talk with parents so they would feel comfortable. I remember the first day of school, I was standing there by the door saying hello to students. And a kindergarten came up to me and put her arms around me and said, hi, how are you? And I. I said, I'm fine, thank you. She said, I don't mind that you're black. So I knew that she had listened at home, that you're going to have a black principal. And she didn't care. It's the atmosphere. And I said, well, to myself, I said, well, now I have to work for parents. I had more education than the previous principal at that school. And so it was really a challenge, and um, I think 90% of the people there accepted me. One of the things I said to teachers after a fog was that I would like a kind of a dress code, that we are models for students, and we want an image of teachers looking like teachers. And they said, well, Dolores, we don't know about that. I said, well, think about it at a staff meeting. And then the next day I found a note on my desk that, you know, we're going to the union on this. I said, okay, fine, bring the union. We, we can sit down and talk. The union did not come. I'm one of the very few principals who did not ever have a union to cross my path. So that was a challenge. But the following week, they dressed. They looked like teachers. Yes. And so I was very pleased with that. Mm -hmm. So you have you always had a passion for kids and younger, younger people? Yes. I have because my, I had a parent, a mother, who was a teacher. I'm an only child. And so I would go to school with her when kindergarten, first grade. I walked into a first grade class reading on a third grade level and flunked the second grade. They did not understand me for whatever reason. And then they decided that I needed to go into a special class. My mother said, no way. There's just no way she's going into a special class. And so that was the challenge there also. So you come up with it all of your life. You're, you're faced with problems of educating, of talking to people. So that's my background. The Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s deeply affected the entire country. In Tacoma, black people continued to endure housing discrimination, living in neighborhoods that were falling apart, a lack of a say in politics, and few economic opportunities. While there was no legal segregation, for example, whites only drinking fountains, white people still excluded African Americans from many parts of the community, including preventing them from buying or renting housing outside of Tacoma's Hilltop neighborhood. Many in the city feared that the violence in other parts of the country surrounding racial issues would erupt in Tacoma. The mayor and the city council were very conservative and worked against programs designed to help the city deal with poverty and racism. 
The black community knew that it was time for a change in Tacoma as black people and their allies fought for change across the United States. Harold Moss, then of the NAACP Youth Council, warned Tacoma that when young people suffer inequality, quote, an explosion is just around the corner, end quote. The anger in the hilltop community came to a head one night in 1969 and what came to be known as a Mother's Day disturbance. An attempted arrest of a black man led to angry confrontations with the police, vandalism, and destruction of property. The police officers were accused of brutality, and one officer was shot and wounded in the conflict. The black leadership of Tacoma knew that they had to respond to this incident quickly to prevent violence. Thomas Dixon, Harold Moss, James Walton, Reverend Ernest Brazil, and others managed to calm down the community. Reverend Brazil described, When I was coming home from church, they were all lined up, up and down the street. The police said, Would you say something? And we will back you up and try to settle it. We just asked them if they'd go home, because if they stayed on the street, they would have gotten into a riot. Mr. Dixon later explained, We are sure that had it not been for us, there would have been a bloodbath and death in Tacoma. Following the disturbance, black leaders met with the city council and demanded increased neighborhood services and representation on the police force and in the fire department. They eventually achieved these goals. The mayor soon lost his bid for re-election, and the citizens of Tacoma removed five city council members from office. Tacoma's African Americans continued to worry about their community and saw a strong need for action. They formed the Tacoma Black Collective as a regular opportunity to address the concerns and issues of the black community. Since 1970, they have met every Saturday, every week of the year. Any black person may attend to listen and to be heard. The Mother's Day riot brought the black community together, and we've been together ever since 1969, says Thomas Dixon. Uh, it, was, it was home. Uh, it was it was um, the African American community that I had left in Chicago had reinvented itself uh, here in Tacoma and 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 I I have always been lucky. I mean, it um, uh, not just lucky but profoundly lucky um, because there was no design that I knew of. Uh, that would uh, have this organization come about. <clears throat> and there was no plan that I would connect myself to the Black Collective. Um, uh, but there I did around uh, 1970 uh, and 71. And um, they started around 68. And to this day, I'm still seen sometimes as a newcomer. <laughs> <laughs> So, so quite often it's identified that I helped to create the Black Collective. It was created uh, when I showed up under different auspices and different names. And if you, were, if you want to get into that, I'd be happy to, to, to roll you back into that. But, but what, we, what we did is that we uh, found a community that was not built on hierarchy. And I think what you see in, um, uh, especially in the Midwest, East Coast, uh, in in some cases, uh, West Coast, but it is is a hierarchy, and you have um, a people who are uh, um, uh, individuals of note. Uh, they are uh, doctors or lawyers or elected um, uh, to political office, uh, folks with high academic achievement. There is a social stratification in the black community. Uh, much of that did not exist uh, in Tacoma. Much of that did not exist when I came to this group of people where we saw folks with PhDs sitting next to people with GEDs. And I said, home, this is home. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, we started to look at uh, um, what the objective realities were in our community as it related to race. Um, and uh, Tacoma and Pierce County um, failed 
to get a passing mark in any category that you might name. Uh, no box was ticked. Uh, was it housing? No. Uh, racial bias. Was it transportation? No. Racial bias. Was it healthcare? No. Racial bias. Was it education? No. Racial bias. Um, you just could not find a situation in Tacoma and or Pierce County where um, both, most of the principles that um, people who engage in the civic um, uh, arena would think were uh, equitable, healthy, um, civic, um, democratic um, engagement. Um, and um, there were basically two groups of people that we had to deal with. Um, uh, folks who did not understand or appreciate uh, their um, support of institutional racism and those who did understand and appreciate <laughs> institutional racism. And those are the two major categories. And, the, you know, there were people who were sympathetic to uh, Black folks, uh, but none of whom I, I think were willing to put their um, um, uh, economic um, uh, People, people were, were, were okay unless the price was too high to pay. Uh, if, it, if it affected their home, their house, their job, uh, they, they saw uh, engagement of the black community as a zero sum uh, game. That anything that we received took something from them. And they were willing to give up some, some things, but not much. And so we did have some people who were uh, uh, significantly sympathetic, but not particularly engaged to the point where they would appreciate or understand any sacrifices that they would have to make uh, in order to make this move. And so that's, this, this, this was us. If you take away hope, you have won the battle. And the day that we don't think that we can, in fact, make a difference is the day we quit to struggle. And we think we can make a difference, whether people like me at 77 or someone at 17. Uh, we have to, and we do, believe that we can move this proposition forward, the issue of racism and injustice. Imagine you have a job that you're very good at, and you've done it for years, but suddenly your boss says that you're fired. Why? because of who you might love? Does this make any sense? Well, it was the reality in the United States military until recently. If a soldier was a homosexual, the army said they had to be kicked out of the service. It didn't matter how good a soldier that person was, what they did, or how long he or she had served. How do you challenge such injustice? What soldier would stand up for himself and his identity? Who would refuse to hide and insist that the military is wrong? Perry Watkins, 1948 to 1996. Sergeant Perry Watkins' mother raised him to be honest. Living in Tacoma since 1960, he never hid the fact that he was a homosexual. When Sergeant Watkins was drafted by the Army in 1967 to serve in Vietnam, he informed them that he was gay. The Army not only let him enlist, but re-enlist twice more. He performed exceptionally, with his work described as outstanding in every regard. In 1981, after 14 years of service, the Army suddenly decided to discharge Sergeant Watkins due to his homosexuality. In 1984, they finally forced him out. Sergeant Watkins knew this was wrong, so he decided to challenge the Army in court. As he said, I'm not going to throw away 15 years of my life. What the military did was absolutely ludicrous. Sergeant Watkins endured a nine-year legal battle against his, this injustice, even losing his home and filing for bankruptcy. Finally, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals determined that the Army must reinstate
Watkins. Judge Harry Pregerson explained, quote, Sergeant Watkins has greatly benefited the Army and therefore the country by his military service, end quote. The court's ruling would, quote, simply require the Army to continue to do what it has repeatedly done for 14 years with only positive results. Re-enlist a single soldier with an exceptionally outstanding military record, end quote. The court did not rule on whether it was legal for the Army to discriminate against homosexuals, just that they would not discharge Sergeant Watkins. After his victory in 1990, Sergeant Watkins chose not to re-enlist. He instead received an honorable discharge, back pay, full retirement benefits, and a promotion to Sergeant First Class. Since Sergeant Watkins' case was one of the first to address the military's ban on gay and lesbian service members, people all over the country paid attention. Gay rights activists cheered the decision and hoped it would pave the way for more challenges to the Army's discrimination. Christopher Smith, co-chair of the Seattle Stonewall Committee for Lesbian and Gay Rights, told a reporter, quote, The more legal protection we get, the less fear we live under. It's people like Perry Watkins who makes it better for everyone, end quote. The military discharged thousands of individuals over the many years that the ban on homosexuals was in place. The United States Congress finally lifted that ban in 2011. Sergeant Watkins spent the years between 1984 and 1990 giving speeches in favor of lifting the ban on gay service members, and his remaining years after 1990 traveling the country to give speeches about his military experiences. Sergeant Perry Watkins remained true to himself and stood up for what was right, no matter the cost. When you're doing something, you know within yourself whether it's right or wrong. So there's a comfort zone, or there's an uncomfort zone that you're in. My uncomfort zone was being on the city council, being the first black female on the city council. So you're in this area again. I remember at uh, being a former president of the Tacoma NAACP that I was standing from in front of the microphone asking for help. And then I realized that I should be on the other side of the microphone, giving out help. And so that again was a challenge, and so this has been a challenge all my life. I was very fortunate to have been on the city council, come on the city council when Karen Vial was the mayor. And we had a very good relationship as females. And Karen was the type of person who liked to take cha challenges. So was I. And then as far as representing the hilltop area was a challenge. Because for years, I thought, and it's true, that Hilltop had been ignored for years. And I want to uplift Hilltop, see it the way that I see it. I once lived in Hilltop. I have been discriminated in Hilltop. And people had a wrong voice, thought of this area. I was on the city council at the time that the gangs were very revered. And then I invited them to my house, the leaders to my house, and said, you're inviting gangs to your house? I said, yes. Someone must talk with them. There's an atmosphere of something here that they need to say, and I want to hear it. And so, we would sit down at my kitchen table. And the members of the ringleaders of the gang would talk to me. Now, there is a communication problem because I'm older, they're younger. So I knew that somewhere along the line that we weren't going to meet. But it was, but they had, I had to listen. And after a while, I would drive around Hilltop, I go through the alleys and, and I would see them and they would wave at me, hi, little mama. <laughs> and, I was, and I would say hi, and I would say hi to them, you know. So everything was, everything was fine. History is very important. 
we must be able to see where we come from in order to make progress as far as where we are going. It's a historical background. And that's very important for our youth to know about history. The history of Tacoma, for example. How we are where we are right now and how did we get there? And who helped us get there? And will there be a continuation? But history is a background to learn from. It's a start. It's not an end. It's a start. And so that is very important for us to know the historical part of Tacoma. Tacoma is my home. I love Tacoma. And so history is very important to me. What would you tell a young woman or a girl who's hoping to make a difference in the world or in the city, but there, there's a lot of things going on in the world that might be discouraging to them. What advice would you give them? There is a saying years ago that there was a very smart woman in the community. And the youth saw this woman and said, let's play a joke on her. So they found a bird, put the bird in their hand and went to the woman and said, this that I hold in my hand today, is it dead or is it alive? This woman looked at the youth and smiled and said, it is in your hands. Today's youth, it is in your hands. We have just given you a start.